The year is 1063, the place Sicily, near the village of Cerame. Roger of Outville sits atop his warhorse, with 130 Norman knights beside him. Facing them is the Emir Ibn al-Hawas and 3,000 Saracen warriors. Against such odds, most commanders would be ordering an immediate retreat, but Roger is a rare man in history. He's gone from landless knight to major player in southern Italian politics. He is certain that his knights are the best in the world. As his men lower their lances, he's about to give the order to charge. What happens next will decide the fate of Sicily for centuries to come. In a previous episode, we discussed how Roger of Outville and his undaunted wife Judith seized power in the Sicilian city of Troina. Thus, the Normans have carved for themselves a little domain in a region of northeastern Sicily called the Val de Mone, inhabited mostly by Greek-speaking Christians. However, the vast bulk of the island is still ruled by an Arab emir, Ibn al-Hawas. Based in Palermo, the third largest and wealthiest city in the Mediterranean, Ibn al-Hawas presides over a lavish, powerful Sicilian emirate. Though shocked by the initial Norman successes in the north, he's not about to let Roger overrun his whole island, which has been controlled by the Saracens since the 9th century. Now, Ibn al-Hawas seeks help in eliminating the Norman threat once and for all. He dispatches messengers to Tunisia in North Africa, asking its ruler, Tamin, to send reinforcements. Tamin is happy to oblige, for Sicily provides an abundance of wheat to North Africa, which the Emir Tamin is loath to see lost to the Normans. Tamin sends not one, but two armies, commanded by his own sons, Ali and Ayub. Ibn al-Hawas warmly welcomes the North African reinforcements. As the Tunisian troops are assembled alongside the Sicilian army, it becomes clear that this will be a coalition of at least several thousand. Berber warriors under Ali and Ayub make up the largest contingent, while Ibn al-Hawas himself commands a sizable army drawn from the great cities. Ibn al-Hawas knows that Roger's knights are few. He's also aware of the skill and courage of the Normans, but he's convinced that his own large coalition will simply overwhelm Roger's small cavalry. Roger has spent the spring making raids into enemy territory, enriching himself and his men. With their swift horses and heavy armor, Roger and his Normans are formidable indeed. But even more important is their discipline. Roger's men have been fighting together for a long time, and they deeply trust their commander. Roger is a handsome and dashing young knight who easily attracts men to his allegiance. He feasts and makes merry with his knights, but he also fights and rides hard with them. When he hears news of the advance of Ibn al-Hawas and his North African allies, Roger is undaunted. His men are alarmed by reports of the size of the enemy army, which is far larger than any they've dealt with in Sicily. But Roger rouses their courage with his own confidence. They've been outnumbered before, and yet they still conquered. They'll not back down from this battle. The army that Roger assembles in the summer of 1063 is definitely small. He leads no more than 130 knights, including his nephew, Serlo of Outville, recently arrived from Normandy. His infantry numbers little more than three or four hundred men. Roger is careful in selecting the terrain where he will make his stand. He picks a site not far from Troina, some miles west of the river Chirami. Here, he positions his men on the top of an open slope, which will give his knights plenty of space to deliver their charge. Not only will the Arabs have to fight uphill, but they'll be forced to ford a stream. The site is near enough to Troina, however, that Roger's men can make a quick retreat in the event of defeat. Soon, Ibn al-Hawas arrives with his allies. They position themselves across from Roger's knights. For three days, the two armies face each other neither willing to engage. Then, on the fourth day, the Arabs dispatch a raiding force to the village of Cherami. Serlo, leading 30 knights, defends Cherami and repels the raid. Now, 
the main Saracen force attacks the Norman vanguard, which is personally commanded by Roger himself. The Arabs are hurled back, but they keep attacking. Repeatedly, Roger holds his formation. Serlo, at the head of a small detachment, leads countercharges from the flanks that continuously thwart the charges of the Berber horsemen. By evening, the North African troops are exhausted from trying to attack the Normans uphill. Ibn al-Hawas and the brothers Ali and Ayub agree that nothing more can be done and command their men to withdraw. Roger seizes this moment. With the sun going down and the enemy exhausted, he begins slamming the retreating Arab and Berber forces with repeated cavalry charges. This spreads panic through Ibn al-Hawas's coalition and the orderly withdrawal quickly collapses into a disordered rout. The Normans aggressively pursue their advantage, mowing down Saracen troops. By nightfall, the Arab and North African forces are annihilated. Roger captures the enemy camp. By morning, the Normans hunt down the scattered remnants of their foes with no opposition. The Norman victory at the Battle of Chirami is incredible. The booty captured is enormous, but the ransoms that come in later from captured Arab aristocrats make Roger and his band of adventure seekers fabulously wealthy. The loss has significant long-term consequences for Arab power in Sicily. Never again will the Arabs launch a large-scale offensive against the Normans. Although for the time being, Arab rule is secure in Palermo and the other great cities of the south, from now on the Arabs will be reacting to the offensive thrusts of the Normans. News of the victory is spreading all over Christendom. Roger himself sends word to Pope Alexander II. As they stand before the Pope, Roger's messengers report that, on the day of the battle, many Normans swore that they saw St. George himself mounted atop a white charger, riding alongside them as they hurled back the Saracens. The messengers also present the Pope with a gift of four camels, captured from the North African army, much to the amusement of the Pope's court at the Lateran. Alexander II is overjoyed by Roger's achievement. For some time now, the popes have been eager to see Sicily reconquered for Christendom. The Pope sends Roger a papal banner to sanctify his efforts and offers to soldiers fighting to restore Sicily a blanket absolution. Thus, Roger's Sicilian project becomes something of a proto-crusade, a theater in which the concepts of crusading will develop and evolve in the decades leading up to Pope Urban II's famous speech at Clermont in 1095. If you like this video, check out my novel of the Crusades, Why Does the Heathen Rage? Click the link below.